So one thing that uh, Isha, she doesn't say, I can say this here is less people. My, my actual real nickname within WSO2 is Troublemaker. Um, you can ask anybody, the engineering guys, the marketing guys, I'm the troublemaker. They can tell you why. All right, um, so let's talk about innovation. Uh, basically, um, as an extension to what s was just explaining before, um, how and why would you use APIs is really what my role is today to uh, convince you of. So um, why APIs? So first of all, let's all agree on what an API is. Uh, so how many in the room is, are technical people? All right. So the others, you're like non-technical. <laughs> all right. So I put that definition here for all of you. So that uh, basically API is really the technical term. The non-technical term is there's some business functionality, some data somewhere that I want to expose to developers so they can innovate writing applications, leveraging that functionality or that, the, that data, basically. So think of it as exposing some interesting things to third parties uh, I'll, I'll get into a few more details uh, uh, during this talk, but th this can be equally internally or externally. It doesn't make any difference to who you're actually exposing this, right? Um, that's actually a very key part because most of our customers actually start internally first, start exposing APIs for their own consumption, for their own developers, the same way they would do it, and then they take part of this, or the entire set of APIs they have created and open it to a larger public, could be partners, could be really completely open, which is like open to anybody in the world who actually to, to have a look at this. Um, so one of the, some, as you can see, I'm gonna be also another, I'm gonna be the analytics freak now, so after what I said this morning. Uh, one of the key things we're pushing for APIs as well, which is really important, is the monitoring and analytics. Right? The, if you deploy this right, it's gonna be the entry point into your entire architecture which means by monitoring what's going on there, you can basically know what's going on in your entire architecture. That's a really key point. If, even if you're not going to do this now, what we tell all customers, at least I do, I think everybody does, is enable whatever you do, enable it to you know, turn on a switch and have monitoring on. Even if you're not going to you know, deploy this now, it is really hard to add monitoring to something if you haven't planned it from the beginning. It's like adding logging to something if you haven't planned for it, or tracing. You'll have to go through every single line of code and say, oh, I wanted to trace there and I wanted to trace there. If you do it as you write the code, it's basically painless. It's, it's really the same principle, right? And, and then this notion of monetization, or I'm sure you've heard the term of API economy, which is like floating there a lot uh, in the industry for a, a many API management vendors. So the notion of monetization is basically how can I make money out of those APIs? And, and sometimes the answer is you won't, right? That's not your goal. Your goal is to expand your business. It's not to make money. Very few customers of, of our API management for us is one of the top, if not now in 2015, was the number one product we sold, basically, to tell you how strong that movement is. Um, is every cust most of the customer we have really use uh, APIs for innovation within their company and not so much for selling it. A notable, uh, I would say, uh, exception to the rule is uh, Sanjiva this morning talked about StubHub, uh, which you, I don't know if you know actually StubHub here. Uh, in, in, in Europe, they are just in a couple of countries. But basically, it, it's like eBay for events if you want, it's a marketplace for selling events. So for them, from a business point of view, obviously they want to enable everybody to have access to their catalog of events. And in order to motivate you to do that, they won't actually get you to pay by the number of calls that you make. They're not interested in that, right? They don't want to limit the number of calls you're gonna make. What they want you is to sell events and basically will give you some kind of royalties to simplify the story. On, on what you sell. So there is monetization there that the APIs actually enable, even if they are not selling directly the API. So the concept of API economy and monetization 
is not only about selling the API by the call, but it's enabling that, I would say, business model around the APIs. That's really the key point, right? So it is proven and proven again that the APIs, once they're exposed, are really the fuel for innovation, agility, rapid development. So let me take you, give you a few examples. You all know those companies. Well, we'll talk about Uber again in a different context this time. Uh, Uber is one of the most successful APIs program. Now, uh, I can tomorrow, so let me give you, let, let's take a story. Let's say tomorrow I leave WSO2 and I start writing mobile applications, right? I can have an instant, if my mobile application requires it for some reason, um, I can immediately in maybe half a day leverage the Uber APIs and add a little button to my mobile application that says request Uber via vehicle. It's not going to cost me anything. I will never have to talk to Uber. Just, you know, basically onboard the APIs program, probably they get some kind of key. And off I go and I'll do that. I'll could use, do you guys know Stripe here? You know what Stripe is, right? Payments. So the same thing. If I want to have mobile app and I want to have payments integrated in that app, I can immediately have access to a total payment platform that supports absolutely every business card, uh, sorry, credit card, debit cards, etc., around the world without ever talking to a bank, right? All this innovation is only possible because they have open APIs that allow me to actually do this, right? Uh, Facebook, uh, I read this like a couple of days ago for, for this presentation, has now 175,000 applications deployed on Facebook. All of them use APIs, right? And, and uh, lots of people out there are innovating and deploying all those funny things that we like to play with on Facebook, leveraging those APIs as well. Nest, that's an IoT, uh, very good example as well. Right, it's very, uh, if you want to plug into uh, those uh, sensors, I still haven't found the word since this morning of what a Nest thing is called. Um, whatever, monitor, sensor, let's call it a sensor. There's another word, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so you have a Nest thing deployed in your home, same thing, you want to have APIs to be able to capture basically the information that this um, device is actually uh, providing you. Uh, eBay was actually a really, uh, was one of the innovators in, in that space. They were probably had one of the first APIs program. And it's the same thing as TubHub, right? Basically, their interest from a business point of view is that as many people as possible can push things to eBay or sell things from eBay through their own applications, right? So, um, and I left uh, CT for the end. So, Citibank, or CT now, basically is a 200 years old business. Uh, what can you think of as more conservative in terms of exposing data as a bank, right? You, you wouldn't think that this is the primary business where you want to expose data. So Citibank has been doing an amazing job uh, on exposing some really good APIs about their customer behavior, about credits, about credit cards, et cetera, et cetera, that they don't open to the public, but they open to a lot of different partners as you onboard their program. And they've done a really good job at advertising this, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a second. So basically, I would say, if you have any pushback on, on why would I use APIs, you know, is there a security problem? Hopefully, an example like Citibank, it was a very traditional type customer, Jumping and doing this is really a sign. Like I don't see any any reason why you would actually do it from a security or, or any data privacy. I would say problem. So th this this picture basically, uh, I've put this in there because. Um, so let's see, who has started an SOA program in their company? SOA. Anybody doing SOA architecture? A few people. Okay. So one of the questions we get all the time is, is, what is the difference? I've spent all this time and all this money in SOA, now you're telling me about APIs, and now the next one is microservices, is what uh, <laughs> uh, Frank was saying this morning, right? Um, uh, you know, what, what's the difference? You're taking, me, you're taking me in all kind of directions here. Do I have to do SOA or do I have to do APIs? And, is it some and I see uh, still a lot of confusion about this. So the good news is, if you have an SOA program, just continue there, you're on the right track, right? To take advantage of microservices and APIs, which is the, the subject of this talk, 
Right. So really, the difference between services, which is what SOA deals with, and APIs are those, so let's see if I don't break something, the characteristics that you have here. So in this yellow thing, it says fair license, ease of use, reporting and billing, which is back to our monitoring I was talking about, account management, sales service, dev community. So basically, the, the key point about APIs and the way this all started is with open APIs, which basically means I'm opening functionality or data to people I may never talk to. Right? And because I never talk to them, or will never talk to them, I cannot make assumptions on how I'm going to advertise APIs or get them to use them. Because if, if I think about them as people in being in-house, like my own developers, then I don't have those problems of like self-service. And basically what that means is a developer comes in on a portal, they subscribe, they see what's available, and they use it. Right? That's the experience you're expecting when you're APIs, when it's an open API program. I can fairly use that. You basically, you open those APIs. I have a fair license to actually use those APIs in my own programs, in my own mobile app, if I come back to my example from, from before. Uh, it must be very easy for me to just step up, create an account, and have a relationship with whoever is opening those APIs. This is not something that people look at at all from an SOA perspective. They look only at the technical side of things, like creating the service. But the whole socialization, I would say, of those services is not part of the story. And that's really the key difference from a service and API point of view. It's not the technical difference. It does the same thing, right? But it's how you present it and you share it with the world, right? So as you really do this, the other key program is, is dev community and, and ecosystem. Right. It, it, as you say, is, you know, if you, it's not because you've built some APIs and magically some people are going to use them. You have to do something. Like when CT basically created those APIs, one of the key things they've been doing is uh, um, hackathons, basically, around those APIs and foment with students, with people, how people could actually tap into the power of the APIs to create some really cool applications for themselves. Right? And again, I'm going to insist, even if you are creating APIs for yourselves, for your own application within your own company, do the same thing. You need to socialize the same APIs the same way as if you were exposing them to any developer out there on the marketplace that you don't know about. This is really important. I always tell people when I talk about API management, show developers some love. Right? And that love basically is the same love for your internal developers and external developers. They basically deserve the same functionality, the ease of use, the onboarding. Why is that so important? It is very, very easy for somebody today to just go on the internet, Google something, find it, install it, use it. Right? It's not like you have to wait for IT people to give you something. No. You know, you go to AWS, you put your credit card, you start an AMI, and you have what you want, right? Or, or you go and you find another API that does pretty much what, what you thought the internal one would do. So if you don't give that user experience to your own developers, they'll go and find other ways. Why? Because you've given them some timelines and some, uh, you know, to respect, and they have to deliver that project on time. If you're in the middle of that, then you get in the middle of that, and they will go and find another way of doing it. So it's really important that you treat your customers, uh, your, sorry, your, your developers as your customers. That's what I wanted to say. Okay, the same same thing as you would for any external things. So that's the characteristic of uh, of an open API. So how do you go and do this, really? So this is what we've seen happening over and over and over again at many of our customers. Basically, start by decomposing your business functionality, your business processes, your data into something which is consumable. Right? Those are the services we're talking about. Don't start by just, if you don't have any of that and you start just with the APIs and start tapping directly into a mainframe, you're going to get in real problem. Right, you really have to build the right architecture around accessing this backend information. Right? And that means decomposing as services or microservices. I'm not going to get in that debate right now because we can spend some time on it. But basically, the idea is you have some scoped functionality that people can reuse. Let's put it this way. Right? 
Then you make all of that accessible via APIs. And again, internally, externally, with the same functionality, should you be exposing it internally or externally? The same ease of use, self-service, et cetera, et cetera. You put all this under control. What control means is security. One of the key points as well about APIs is, well, you're going to give some entry point into your backend systems. You need to secure that. You need to protect it. You need to make sure that uh, only the people who are authorized to actually access that functionality can actually access that functionality. And again, same thing internally, externally. It doesn't matter. Right? If you have some very sensitive data and you want to export that through an API because you have some application that needs to consume that information, you better put the right security in place for that. Right? Then back to my analytics. So collect data. So again, this is really the entry point into the architecture. If you look at the architecture picture, we'll look at this in a second you will see every single call comes through that layer. So just collect all that data. And again, if you don't do anything with it, that's OK. You can do it later. Right? It's a shame, though. It's like I have this uh, prospect people I've talked to in Spain. Uh, it's a big bank. They're collecting, on, across all their services, they're collecting 45 gigs, not megs, right? Gigs of data about their transactions every day. Every day. <laughs> They just zip it and they put this in a nice tape somewhere, right? And it's so big that they can't do anything with it, <laughs> basically. They collect all that information, and, you know, so they have to put in place the analytics that I talked about this morning to basically consume that data in, um, you know, in a much more agile way so they can have, at the end of the day, some information about how their system is doing, right? But at least they have entirely instrumented the framework where their services are developed upon so they can collect that data. So the first step is really good. Now they have to do the second step, right? And then build their own ecosystem. So that's really important. Um, you have to do some kind of advertising, those hackathons, uh, so that people will know uh, what's available, right? Um, this is something I really didn't, you know, I, I, I've been working for some time. Uh, I worked in IBM at the time of SOA and registries and ESBs and all that stuff when it all started. And one thing I really didn't think would work in the registries, and unfortunately I got it right, is that it's not enough to just pull something in all in the same place so people would use it. It's not enough, right? It, it, you have to build the right user experience around it so that people will want to come and see what's available, right? So that's why, and until we got that concept uh, in API management, in our product, we call that stores. Until we got that concept of stores that you know app stores for you know Apple and Android are using, which makes it very easy to find something, to consume it, to rate it, it's socially integrated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That gives a complete different user experience on sharing APIs as opposed to just dumping something somewhere and hope some people are going to come and, and, and find it, right? So you, you, th that's the evolution from, I would say, a registry repository all the way to a store, is how easy it is to come and, and self-sign and use this. So that's the last point. And then you do it again, and you iterate over this, right? So one other key message is really the APIs are to the tip of the iceberg of your architecture. Right? You're going to expose some functionality, and again, don't try to just do APIs on top of backend functionality without the right architecture in the middle. Right? What you want to get to is something like this. So bear with me for a second. That's kind of not that complicated. Right? You have external applications, internal applications at the bottom. Sorry, see my dot is here. Internal apps here at the bottom. Right? Ideally, the same API management architecture from a logical point of view, from a physical point of view, you may want to have different deployments. That's a different story. But from a logical point of view, you have a single layer that we call usually an API gateway that controls the access to all your services. Right? Now, what's really in here and, and hidden in here, so I said, like, first, this is your step one in my five-step thing, right? is to create all of that. And it can be some PHP services, things in Tomcat, things in the way, so to whatever it is that you're using. You know, as long as it's a well-formed service with a standard interface, with a published interface, that's all fine, okay? And somewhere behind here, you have plenty of stuff, right? You have mainframes, and you have databases, and you have cloud applications, you have tons of things, okay? 
So that's all fine. You may have to use that layer as well, which is your service composition and orchestration layer. So composition is like I'm calling service one, service two, service three. I'm putting all that together and I'm exposing a new service that calls those three things, right? Or chaining, if you want to, to call it this way. Orchestration would be more like business process. So one is stateless, the other one is stateful. Uh, in, in a business process way, you basically kick off some work that may call upon multiple services, but it may last days. Right? Let's say request a loan from a bank. Right? That would be an example of, of a business process. So you may have that, that's okay. Uh, in most of the customers that we are working with, there is that layer at least, which helps do that composition so that the composition doesn't happen basically on, on the API layer, it happens at the service layer. And then you put this layer of APIs in front of it, okay? And what this will help you do is just expose, this is everything the external and internal application know about. Note that there is no line from here to here, or from here to here. You have to prevent that, right? You don't want people to circumvent <laughs> the whole API layer and come and tap directly into the service layer, right? And the reason you want to do this because you want to apply those quality of service, security, monitoring, throttling, uh, at the API gateway level. So this gateway thing is really not something about doing integration. Its job is I intercept a call, I just apply the right quality of service to it, and I just pass it on the next layer. It should not do anything fancy in the call, starting transforming it or composing calls or things like this. There's no really reason for doing that at that level. Our recommendation is really to do this at this level. So yes, I'm going to say a bad word. This is an ESB. Okay. I'm saying it's a bad word because uh, you know there's this big anti-ESB movement right now that ha arrived with microservices, right? So there's also because there's a lot of API management vendors that don't have an ESB to tell you, sell you, so their solution is to tell you you don't need one. Right, um, so it is very important, like don't, don't listen to people. Maybe you will not need one, maybe you will need one, right? Just look at your use case, look at what you have to do, right? And it is okay <laughs> to use an ESB if you have to. It's not a bad thing, right? It's about the loose coupling that Frank talked about this morning. It's about the composition of the services. And in many, many cases, those things go together. The API management and the ESB go together, right? But yes, in some cases, you may want to directly expose your APIs and talk directly to a backend service. Absolutely fine as well, right? All depends on your use cases. So you have to really look at this. Another use case, which is a bit different from exposing APIs from a business and innovation point of view, but we see that quite a lot as well, is using basically the API gateway layer to protect and control the access to SaaS applications. So if you look at WSO2, today we don't have anything installed in the house to manage, let's say, customer relationships, to manage accounting, uh, to manage our mail. All of this is SaaS apps outside, right? And at some point in time, you need to control the access to those and the APIs to those. So again, this is something you can do through the same layer, except that you go out instead of going in. The, the APIs are outside and not inside. But in, from an architecture point of view, it's exactly the same thing. OK? So I'll just put this in there, just like not do this again. All right, that goes back to my ESB story. Right. Don't do APIs just because you're told you to. Somebody told you to. <laughs> OK? Just have a good reason for doing it. There are plenty of good reasons for doing it. Right? One, one for me, the main reasons a lot of SOA projects didn't work so well is because a lot of people jumped into doing SOA projects without knowing why they were doing it, but rather because everybody else was doing it. When I was at IBM, we used to sell ESBs all the time because, well, if you didn't have an ESB, you were a nobody, basically. Right? So everybody was buying ESBs, and they're like, what the hell are we going to do with this? Um, and, and, that, and for some people, that really worked well. And some others, it really didn't work because they didn't have the right architecture and thinking behind it. Okay? So I'm not trying to disgust you from using APIs, not at all. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is basically having an API program is not only about technology. The same way doing SOA is not about ESBs. 
right? It's about wanting to do a transformation of your company to create services and have the right architecture around it. It's not because you're going to deploy an API management tool or an ESB that you're going to have APIs and a successful API program. And I think that's the key takeaway from a strategic point of view. Right? You need to have executive buy-in into this. You need to have the right architecture built around your ESBs, your APIs, I'm sorry. <laughs> right? So it's not about IT only. What we give you as WSO2 is we give you tools. Right? But you have to use those tools the right way. Right? If I give you a big hammer, right, but your job is not to plant nails, that doesn't mean the hammer is wrong. Right? <laughs> it means you're not trying to solve the right problem with that hammer. So it's a bit the same thing. Right? If I give you an ESB, but what you don't need, that's not something you need, then, well, you're not going to do anything good with it. But it's not the, the problem of the tool. It's the problem of how you're actually using it. Okay? So measure success. This is very important. Analytics in place, being able to you know, tell how successful your API program is, who is using it, how often, et cetera, et cetera. That's a key point. Build this ecosystem I was talking about using Agaton. And you know, as a key thing, just start internally, basically, and expand externally. From a high-level point of view, not technical point of view, those are the key recommendations I would give you as you start with your API, pro API program. Sorry. Um, and the last thought is this, right? Innovation doesn't happen magically. So say, oh, let's innovate. And you innovate, right? <laughs> you have to put the right program behind it to actually put people in the position where they can innovate. And basically, APIs and opening APIs internally and externally, you'll be amazed by what people can do once they have access to information uh, and how they can mash up different information all together to create fabulous results. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.